what happened to our farm? Isn't it kind of weird how when something no longer is a part of your life anymore, it kind of freezes in time? Like you think it's the exact same as when you left it? Like when I imagine our farm in New York, I imagine TJ and Justin in the pastures, all of our chickens. I imagine our gardens exactly as they were, our house the exact same. It's so hard for us to imagine life continuing for other people, for other things, even after our involvement with it ends. Well, our involvement with it did end. It ended in September, 2023. And I haven't really taken time to think about how I feel about that chapter of my life ending. So I'm looking forward to this conversation today with you guys. And right now we're having the conversation from my garden, my new garden, which is not quite done, as you can see. It's a little bit of a construction zone, but we've been working hard to get it ready so that I can really jump back into this huge part of my life that while I've been continuing it in containers and small spaces, guys, my garden was huge in New York. Um, and if you hung around with us when we were there, it's really become the most important hobby in my life and a huge part of my life. And it's a big part of our plans for this new place. Speaking of gardens, I just wanted to take a minute to show you guys what my garden looks like right now. Now we are in January. It's January 31st today. So by the time you see this, it'll be February. And I have these beautiful nasturtium plants that are just taking off finally. They're getting their first flowers. I have never had nasturtium look this healthy. Um, I've grown it many, many years, but it's never looked quite like this. And I attribute this to its love for Southern California. I also have some snapdragons in here. They're a cold, hardy flower, so you can actually grow them in the winter in many places that have very mild winters. And in other places, you can plant them in the fall and they'll come up real early in the spring. Uh, they'll survive many winters. I have some beets in here that look like they're finally bulbing up, but they've been pretty slow. So I think that this bed might be a little high in nitrogen, which is why everything's really green and lush, but not getting the best root development. And then over here, I've got some watermelon radishes, some younger baby beets in the ground, a jalapeno pepper plant that's still alive, <laughs> even as we're going into February, a bunch of carrots that are still growing, more snapdragons, more nasturtium. And I also have some calendula, right behind me, I'll show you guys. That, that calendula has just started blooming and I can't even begin to describe how special it is to me to have these things growing and blooming and producing in the winter. It just, um, after living in a place with a wonderful growing season, uh, six months out of the year, it's really special to have a place with a 12 month growing season. Um, when gardening has become such a big part of my life, I just have really valued being able to not have an end, end date to it. And it does come with its cons though, which you will learn as you said, kind of watch my life unfold here in California. I have this other bed right behind me here, which I haven't paid as much attention to, but in there I do have some fun things like uh, a Thai basil that's a perennial here in California, which is so cool, like basil being a perennial. Um, some of this is just still like a little mind blowing to me. And I have um, a pineapple plant, which my brother-in-law gave to me, which he had started. Um, some Egyptian walking onions and chives, some red sorrel, which grows year round here, and a bunch of weeds, because I haven't been paying a lot of attention to this garden bed, really, or the other one, since we're starting the main garden, and these beds will be going. Uh, I didn't want to dedicate a ton of heart into them, because then I would have just been really sad when we had to tear them out. So, um, but let me give you a little sneak peek at the garden real quick, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about our New York farm. As you can see, there are two beds behind me. We have three finished. We're gonna put um, one in the middle there. We're gonna have three beds on this side. They are 10 by four, so they're 40, 40 square foot of beds. So they're pretty big. And then we're also gonna have three more smaller beds on the other side, which will bring us to six raised beds in the kitchen garden and also a large in-ground bed. And that's just in the garden up here. We're gonna have a lot more growing in future spaces as we continue to cultivate the homestead. And I'm so sorry for my voice. I know it sounds awful. I don't feel as awful as it sounds, but I can't say I feel awesome either. 
So, anywho, let's keep going. I'm gonna settle into my spot. This is gonna be my like talking spot, I think. <laughs> Cause the lighting's so cool. And and also this view is a huge part of why we love our new place. So I left off the story talking about just this real rough patch that we were in for many reasons. I was pregnant, we were in California, we had friends living at our farm in New York, we were trying to decide what was next. And I got a call from a number I didn't recognize and it was a voicemail and it was from somebody I didn't know who had heard about our farm being possibly up for sale and they wanted to know more. I hadn't shared this with you guys but we had been contacted by many people on Instagram, on Facebook, um, by email who were interested in buying our farm and none of them panned out and I quickly realized that trying to sell a farm off market meant a lot of awkward conversations. A lot of people who seemed interested didn't have the money or changed their minds or weren't actually serious. And that was kind of exhausting to navigate and frustrating. So I stopped having those conversations. So when I got this call, it's kind of like, uh, not another one. So I kind of discounted this person and their interest but I was willing to share more information. So I sent them some information. I very quickly let them know, like here's um, kind of the, the estimated like sale price, gave them a range, what it was like, the house, the bedrooms, bathrooms, all that stuff and kind of, okay, this is off my plate. I'm not gonna worry about it. And we, we continued to think about our plans for going back to New York and listing our property in the market. Uh, but this person, they wanted to set up a call. So we talked on the phone. I shared more about my farm, about our farm. Um, they shared more about their interest and they seemed really serious. Again, I've had these conversations before where people seemed really serious, but it didn't pan out. And so I was trying to just take it with a grain of salt, but I was willing to let them see the farm. We weren't going to be there, but I said, okay, like maybe Chris can go out, he can go out and like, April and he can assess the farm, assess what we need to do to get it ready to sell, kind of go out there for a week, a weekend, clean it up, all that stuff. I would have been almost eight months pregnant at that point. So um, I wasn't gonna go, I was gonna stay home, watch Malachi, continue baking the baby, baking, not bacon, baking the baby and let him take care of that. And then while he was out there, I said they could give, he could give them a tour of the farm. Okay, so <laughs> this is where the story gets really interesting. Um, I'm seven months pregnant, and we take a little family trip up to Northern California. There was a part of the state that we really loved, and we were actually considering moving to. Um, it's like in the Sierra Nevadas, the Placerville area, if anyone's familiar with that area. We loved it. We just loved the area, we thought it was beautiful. So we wanted to take a trip up there before I was too late in my pregnancy. And my husband, he's really into cars. My son, he's really into cars. So we wanted to take him to a uh, race, a car race. We all went up to the Northern California area. We went to Sonoma Raceway, we went to the race. We stayed with cousins of mine that live in Napa. And we woke up to get ready to go home after the weekend was over. And that morning we woke up and I started having some labor symptoms. I'm not gonna get into the like details of it, but some signs that um, were concerning for me because I had the same signs with my son a week before I gave birth to him. Um, he was full term, I had him at 40 weeks pregnant, so that's like full nine months, right? I was like 31 and six days pre weeks pregnant, so that's like, eight weeks too early to be having a baby <laughs> and um yeah so i'm like chris let's eat breakfast and like let's hit the road because i'm a little worried and so we did i'm not going to share like the whole story here i'll do it another time because it is a quite the story but ultimately what ended up happening is i went into labor um two months too early with my second baby 
Um, and I delivered her at 32 weeks and three days. So I delivered a baby at 32 weeks and she was not ready to come. I mean, she was, she was early, so she had to be in the NICU. Um, it was like a pretty traumatic experience, but also a really beautiful experience. And I had a lot of peace. And like I said, I'll share that story with you. But as you know, my year at this point has been just kind of like a mess. A lot of stuff happened. And then I have this baby eight weeks early. So, um, yeah, that happened. Um, so Chris, he was going to go out to New York in April. That quickly got canceled because we had a baby in the NICU. We weren't sure when we were going to bring her home. At this, I gave birth on April 7th. So we weren't even sure, we weren't sure if she'd still be in the NICU at that point, when she'd be coming home. So he canceled his trip to New York. So with the trip canceled to New York, and a, suddenly a new premature baby, there was a lot of, I think, anxiety about what were you gonna do about the farm? How are these people gonna visit the farm and see it? How are we gonna get out to New York, get it ready to sell? It was just a luck. Luckily, we were able to ask a family member to give this family a tour of the farm. It was in like the late winter, early spring, so everything was like pretty wet. So we're kind of like, well, they can take it or leave it. Like they'll see it the way it is, you know, before it's really beautiful. And if they like it then, they're gonna love it in the summer, in the fall, in the spring. So he gave them a tour and they loved it. <laughs> and we were kind of surprised. Like what, This is this still moving forward? And they made like an official offer with a letter. They had a real estate agent help them draft up an offer. And we reviewed it. We made a, like kind of a counter offer. And it was accepted. And we we're kind of like, oh my goodness, we sold our farm. <laughs> and it was just kind of wild because it was right at this time where we were really feeling anxious about all the things we would have to do to get it ready for the market. We were feeling anxious about having to go out to New York a lot and we really didn't want to because we had a baby in the NICU and our, also our, our two and a half year old son. There was so much happening and it was just like we didn't know how the pieces were all going to come together and then suddenly this family, they wanted to buy our farm, they made an offer, we accepted it and we didn't have to do anything to get our house or our farm ready. They wanted it like as is. We just had to like move our stuff out. And so we took a big like sigh of relief. Like, <sighs> and so we sold our farm off market. Um, it wasn't sold for many months later. We, I think it was like, they still had to list their property and sell their property. We started just kind of like figuring out how the pieces would work together. And that was in April, May, when we kind of knew our farm was sold. So then, we were like, okay, so our farm sold, like it's gonna sell in August, which is like kind of when, when our closing date was scheduled. Like we gave ourselves like a big buffer for us and for them um, to get it all situated. And it was really low stress, which was awesome. And they're awesome people and a great family. So the family that um, purchased our farm, they had uh, three kids, two daughters and a little son. And they really wanted to do a lot with gardening and permaculture and educating the community especially youth about growing food and they wanted to have animals i know they want they definitely wanted to have want to have horses we actually met through uh the new owner of my horse tj and that was how we got connected so it was just really cool situation they were, they were like really excited about all the perennials we had about the gardens about the land and you know we didn't get the most money in the world for our farm it really wasn't about money of course we needed to get a certain dollar amount so that we could have money to purchase what we have now but our goal wasn't to like get the most we possibly could for for our new york farm our goal was to get what we needed and to find a new family that would love it and steward it the way that we did since our farm was like under contract we were like okay well i guess let's start looking and see what's out there when it comes to property and um it wasn't long until we were under contract for our new homestead. So I am gonna pick up the story back um, and share how we found this farm, how this came to be, 
and give you a little preview at what is in store here at the Sunshine Farm in California. Okay, friends, see you next time. Bye. And hopefully my voice will sound better too.